Today, we are excited to be joined by Patrice Newell, an Aboriginal Australian with a PhD in Alternative Energy and an Order of Australia for her services to agriculture and the environment. Patrice has hosted the Today Show, is a sustainable farmer, a best-selling author, an environmental advocate, and now the co-founder of Koala, an investment app to help people invest directly in companies that take climate change and social equity seriously. Patrice, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Welcome to your In Good Company. Hey, pleasure. Maddie, Sophie, good to be here. Patrice, we always start the episode in the same way by asking, what's the best thing that has happened to you in the past seven days? Well, that's easy, waking up this morning. I go to bed every night thinking, <laughs> you know, you never know when the end is coming. And when you wake up, I'm eternally grateful. So the best thing was waking up and um, knowing I was going to be talking to you. Every day is a good day. Being alive is a good day. That's very kind and a great attitude to have. I like it. Patrice, if you could have dinner with anyone, who would it be and why? Well, I have often reflected, I wouldn't mind having dinner with my younger self, right? The wise and the young mm, or the like older that. and the Not young, right? Saying a few important things uh, to that younger person. <laughs> uh, and I used to say Gloria Steinem was one um, who, as a feminist, I followed um, all my life. And she's branched out and talked about the big picture, where we've all learnt from her her ideas, discussions, things she's brought to us to consider, but also her personal journey. You know, she never learnt how to drive. You know, she lived through the 20th century into the 21st mm. and never, never drove. She always had a great diversity of friends and shared these extraordinary and, – and I think that was, that was a thing because when you grow up, um, you – you know, you, you're in your family's cohort, your parents' cohort, and then your school cohort, uh, whereas she seemed to just know these amazing, diverse people. She was a traveller from a young age uh, because of her father. And, and I just think to make a commitment to social justice and, all the, and, fit and equality for gender equality um, was, uh, you know, a fabulous commitment to a big life. So I'd say Gloria Steinem. I'd put her probably at the top of my list, yeah. I feel like she would have had an incredible personality, someone that would just, you know, you'd feel very attracted to if she had such a diverse cohort of friends mm. and family, etc. She was a kind person. You know, she, yep. she I, I think that really has come through now. I noticed a, a photo popped up somewhere of her, who's she's in her 80s now, um, and she's always been a stylish woman, but she clearly didn't give a toss, you know, in the, you know, here I am, I'm 80 now. She's not trying to hide it. And she's with a couple of very young people who were like me, I guess, excited to, to be with her. I think that's a great thing if you can grow old and people uh, want to be with you. Young yeah, people. absolutely. I hope that's, that's us when we're older. <laughs> that's us. <laughs> Now, we are definitely investing related, so swapping it to a company, if you could be a stock or company, who would you be and why? Well, you're talking to someone here uh, who did not grow up investing, and so that is easy because it has to be Koala because I feel that <laughs> it, I'm sorry, but it, it, it's so obvious. I mean, you are Koala. You <laughs> yeah. have founded it yourself. <laughs> yeah, and and I'm proud of it, and it is something – it's like creating something that you wish you had access to when you were younger. So I like, uh, I like, I, I like companies where you know the people, not just like the Elon Musk types who are boasting about what they do. But, you know, it's good to know the people in a company. It's good to know that the company, the foundation and how that's described of a company. So I have to say Koala to that that question well i'm looking forward to getting much more into what you guys have built at koala in a little bit but before we do i want to take a little bit of a step back because you have had a very varied and quite incredible career that i think a lot of our listeners will be really keen to learn more about so from working at the sbs yeah. to moving into sustainable farming and now launching your very own business 
Can you tell us about a particular experience or challenge that you sort of confronted that took you by surprise that I guess you never would have imagined that you could have come across had you not experienced it yourself? Well, I, I feel for young people today because, you know, they still get asked, what do you want to do when you grow up? You know, you hardly ever grow up. You know, you grow whole time. You don't grow up uh, is one thing. So so long as you are interested in always growing and tuning in to um, relationships because it's people that give you opportunities. Now, I I was going to be a nurse, Okay, I was meant to be a nurse and mm. the, the cyclone hit Darwin. They wiped out the hospital. I couldn't go. I started modelling. I had a modelling career. And then in those days, there were not supermodels uh, and it just sort of happened uh, and it was a job. I mean, there were married models because everyone married young, but there weren't models with babies back in my day. But it did learn. Mm. People think modelling, you know, everyone's really nice to you and says lovely things. It's quite the opposite, actually. It really taught me to be tough. So, you know, your bum's too big and your hair's this and what did you drink too much last night? And, oh, look, you've got a pimple there. There's a lot of negativity around that profession. Oh, and it taught me to stand firm and not be impacted by negative thoughts. It toughened me. And the other thing is, people have said to me now, oh, why are you doing koala now? Why move into the finance sector? Why go into investing? And I say, why not? Because you, girls, you <laughs> will have a lot of careers in your life. And I think that is the great beauty. Mm. Um, and that's where feminism has been a great bonus to us, because we can do all the different things. You might be, you know, sitting there this morning thinking, oh, I'd love to be a farmer or I'd like to be an astronaut or whatever you may want to be secretly that you don't tell people. And guess what? You can do it later on if you really want to. So um, the lesson so is, excited. the lesson, yeah, I, I think we're going to live a lot longer. You know, you will live to way over 100, look after yourself and have good fortune. So um, <laughs> health-wise, health-wise, not financially, but health-wise, therefore you, we will all want to not be caught into one thing. So, so um, I didn't plan any of it, okay? I didn't plan one thing. I just, opportunities came and I thought, oh, interesting. Yeah, I probably had a fantasy of writing books. Maybe I had a fantasy when I was young about that. Mm. Well, then you did go write a book. Well, I did. many a book and you've also written a PhD. Yeah. I say I love that. We ask what the lesson is, the toughest lesson that you've learned. And instead of being like, you know, it's the PhD, which I'm, I'm sure would have been very challenging, you've turned to modelling. So it's always interesting when chatting to people about the challenges they've overcome. But I guess turning to Koala and also investing, I mean, have you made any investing decisions that have been really instrumental to your investing journey thus far? Well, let me say that I grew up in a household with no money. Every cent counted, every penny counted, and we never discussed money except one very important thing, and that is to live within your means. And I've carried that and I carry that today. I carry that in Koala, you know, keeping the business of Koala functioning and everything, all my own personal stories. Now, we didn't use the word investing. We used the word saving. We were saving. But part of what I was taught subliminally, just because there wasn't much money, you, you paid for what you had to pay for. You had a job. You got some money. You paid for the things you must pay for, um, food and fuel, etc. Uh, and then you always saved some. And then the investment uh, component was in an apartment, so that was my first investment. And I did not have one friend who ever invested in shares. It was never a conversation. I had no family, no one. No one absolutely had any, uh, any experience. And I was one of my, when I was younger, I was one of the first people to buy an apartment. I didn't have any of my friends didn't own an apartment. So they learned from me. Mm -hmm. What was it like talking to the bank manager? It was, it was, so it was, Going forward with a lot of personal experience, I'm pretty ignorant. 
And I'd say there's a lot like you are having conversations to people who are new and they are learning through the conversation. It's I very little conversation in my day because most people since I've got older, I have found that they learnt through their parents and often their mother. So that's another thing. It's been very interesting. They've been quietly at home, you know, reading the financial review, looking at the finance pages and <laughs> educating themselves and having a few conversations to their, their children. Hmm. I think we're very conscious when we do this podcast and have these conversations that I guess number one to be in a position where you actually are physically able to invest is quite a privilege. Like not everyone mm. has sufficient money that's coming in and going out to actually be able to put that money aside and put it away for the long term comfortable that they're not going to ne- not going to need to access it anytime soon. But I think what I would sort of layer on to that is we're so lucky today that investing is more accessible through things like Koala and the other products that we have now than it ever has been before. Like, you know, not long ago you had to call your broker and they had to place the trades for you and it was really expensive and there were minimum trades of, you know, $5,000 plus. And now you can literally invest with $10, $100 and it's made it so much more accessible for people like us. So I think we're so lucky that the conversation is changing, the technology, you know, it's really democratising. And it's allowing more people more opportunities to like grow their wealth and get involved. There are a lot of things people complain about in the modern world, you know, things we don't like. And the digital world, it's come upon us so fast. It's, it's, there's a lot to take on board. But it is one of the most remarkable things because the, dig- the digital age has allowed us uh, to to participate in ways we've never participated before. And I can only say it is exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. And it doesn't take Mm. what it used to take in the past was, you know, I have to save up. Uh, How do I know that broker's a good broker? Will I like them? Do I trust them? How does it work? You're not really in the system unless you're sort of a semi-professional or a professional. Mm. Uh, Whereas now um, with your phone, being able to do it with your phone, you can quietly do it. I think that is a really important thing because Mm. even though um, we are having conversations about money now, it's very personal. It's very private and no one shares everything. You know, people might tell a bit of fibs and exaggerate about circumstances, but when you can do it on the privacy (laughs) of your own phone, you can feel it differently. And I think that is important. So for everybody that's a bit nervous, that's never done it before, but uh, thinks, why can't I have a portfolio, you know, for 30 years and have it grow? You know, why do rich people, they've been able to do it, they're connected, that you can participate in something that really most people have not been able to participate. I agree with you, Maddie. It's it's one of the great things about the mm. digital age. So I'm excited to hear then, how has it been sort of building Koala, the ethical investment app, and I guess sort of what excites you the most about the ethical investment space? Well, one of the one of the things I used to think, uh, bearing in mind my co-founders have experience in investing. Okay, so they 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 don't come to, they don't come <laughs> so to put that out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's not all of us who've never done it, right? My co-founders are um, <laughs> experienced in a lot of other things, completely different to me. But that's one of the good things about having a diverse group of people coming together to build something. Um, the having shares. Do you just want to share? You know, do you just want something? No, we found that when we did our early research, when we were thinking about Koala, people said, "Oh, I don't want to be in the banks." You know, the the Hain report had just happened, and like no gambling. You know, none of that stuff facilitating gambling and everybody had an opinion about what they didn't want that was important and then of course you frame it in a climate emergency and then you've got whoa is it going to add is it going to be bad is it going to be part of this and that led to a conversation about you know businesses is is responsible and will uh, build the future economy so it's all this movement of money that's building it. And that includes things like your telephone, phone, like your mobile, because it's made of metals. It's made with semiconductors. It's, 
And so we, as we developed the portfolio, we realised that we were keen to include all the various companies, big companies and complicated companies, making the bits for the new modern world. So it's not, um, I suppose, and, and we were really uh, obsessed about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, those 17 goals. And so if we thought the portfolio is framed so that every company in it, so all those in the ETFs and the direct investments are analysed in relation to the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So important things like gender equity, reducing poverty, because every company has an impact in different areas. The other thing is, of course, companies are run by people. People are not perfect. We sort of want companies to be perfect. None of them are perfect, <laughs> but some focus and do good works in different areas, uh, leading and supporting um, those goals. Yeah, I think it's kind of cool to have something almost anchored to a very well-known type of goal. You know, a lot we're taught about the sustainability development goals throughout uni. We talk about them at work. So when you are investing, it's nice to be able to look towards something and say that's what that company is working towards if they are anchored to it. Mm -hmm. But I am interested because you did, you know, touch on the fact that sustainability really means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So it can be quite difficult when you're talking about sustainability to kind of narrow down or always have the same opinion as someone else. What does mm. sustainability and when you link it with investing mean to you? You know, what do you look at? Well, I go back to the original word that people use the, the, the definition, it's um, having growth without um, trashing the future for the next generation. You know, you don't use up all the resources. And for those of us that have been talking in the sustainability space for a long time, that it's not static. Well, you'd know that, right? Because in the very beginning, I remember when we just used to talk about triple bottom line and have social somewhere in the conversation. You know, it's come a long way. It's not over. And everybody who joins the table and the conversation has their own pet issue and wants to include another component that they think is important. That's why those 17 goals, I think, tried to bring it together together. Is it perfect? I don't know. People, I, I wanted the word soil on it, for instance, when they came up and have earth, but they didn't have the word soil. So I felt fungi quite lost out in that discussion. Fungi essential to soil and earth growth. So I have my own pet issues uh, myself. But um, so sustain, that, I think if you bring it back to the fundamentals, is a company doing something and exploiting the resources that it needs to be successful, then it is not sustainable. That is over. We have a climate emergency because industrial capitalism has failed. It failed because it treated all the natural capital of the world as for free. It got it for free. And here we are trying to reconcile it and retrofit it. Yeah, it's, we've got a lot to learn. I think, you know, humans are creative. We can do it, but you've got to make a commitment to doing it. That's the challenge. And, you know, we've been talking about climate change for so long now. There hasn't been a commitment. Even I was at a conference the other day and our um, a minister got up and said, oh, in 2020, when my child was born, I suddenly realised, I go, 2020? And you suddenly realised oh you cared about the future because you had a child. Oh I thought, wow, been in Parliament for eight <laughs> years. And this is the thing. It, it <laughs> takes a commitment and people have their awakening yeah. through all sorts of reasons. Mm. But I do believe in, the, in humans. I think we've done some bad things. Our capacity to, to do good, though, is high. Yeah. I find it interesting 
the link you there, are. like you were saying, that companies have kind of exploited outside their means and then also on a personal level, because it's not just responsibility of companies, it's as individuals as well with sustainability. What you said before about, you know, with your money story, you've lived within your means. And I can kind of see that little link there, you know, if you're on the individual level, like really living within our means, not just money wise, but sustainability wise. And then also the same with companies. And maybe that really reflects in the fact that you have started something like Koala. Mm. Well, I <clears throat> if everybody had an investment portfolio and was really committed to how they spent their money, for instance, is that the answer to the problem? No, right? Because politics matters, really strategic, important political decisions. So I would put where you place your vote is equal to where you place your money. And then third, the third thing I'd add to that is wasting food is just absolutely criminal what people do. And that is something um, people talk about eating meat as being the defining thing. No, people waste food because every action in agriculture costs something. And so where there's waste, whether it's in the paddock, in the supermarket, in your kitchen, if you over order in a restaurant, that counts. So I, I... you know, there are small things, but I don't think we should ever underestimate the importance of our vote, that, that I, I would say. So investing, yes, where you spend, but where you vote is equal. Patrice, before the break, we touched on sort of what sustainability means to you on a more personal level and from your experience. But I am really interested to hear because I know that you have done a lot of work in this area. What do you make of the current climate crisis? Besides being scary, an emergency, the anxiety that still to this day people don't take it as seriously as I think they should, that people in power don't, um, that I live in the Hunter Valley. Uh, Koala is, is formed in regional Australia. I feel like that deserves a pat on the back because for true sustainability and access, you have to have good internet. Huh. Right? That is still not available in Australia, in regional Australia, maybe in towns. Uh, um, I, I personally need to be active in my, I think, koala probably even, See, I did try to get elected to Parliament back in 2007 on a climate change ticket and failed. Certainly oh. ahead of it, certainly ahead of its time in the conversation. We had not even signed yeah. the Kyoto Protocol back then. And I was going to oh. say, do you think it was too early for that? You know, in for how we were, how we as society were seeing it and talking about it. Do you feel like that was the, too early the, for you to get? Completely, the battle between the believers and the non-believers in the science and the interpretation. And because Australia and Mm. at the time and now uh, the coal sector, the problem with coal is there's two types of coal, metallurgical coal and thermal coal. And people, you know, metallurgical coal for building steel and a more, in my view, important resource Uh, needed until that new technology is actually built versus thermal coal when we know that we can do renewable energy uh, but this commitment to exporting coal and for Australia to be part of that. In other words, and these crazy things that get said like, we owe it to the world, you know, to export our coal so they can have an energy sector. No, We owe it to the world to share in creating a better global energy sector, not export our coal for our own wealth or the company's wealth. So I, it's serious. It's serious. But I don't know, we we can't be depressed by it because, you know, that's like slash your wrist stuff. So in our way, you know, that's why waste is important in the climate change conversation because energy is used, like food waste. Every time I live on a farm, you grow things, you use energy. 
So you can't waste it because you've spent all this energy to grow it. You, If you're trying to take it seriously, you cannot waste things. We can't pollute things. We have to just rein it in and be individually tuning into the importance of everything counting. You said that you know, Australia has said to the world, we owe it to the world to export our coal. And we are a really resource rich nation. So do you think that Australia could really lead the way and be, I guess, a superpower when it comes to renewables? Well, I, I, I see our, res, our resource rich nation. I mean, are we the luckiest resource nation in the world? I mean, it's mind boggling you know, with a democracy that really appears to function, even though we whinge about quite a lot of it, uh, our capacity to be, to really take on quality resource management, we have not done it in the coal industry, but that's another conversation. But with all the other metals, the rare metals that we have, that we will be digging up, to do that better and to bring the processing into Australia um, and not export it for to be processed elsewhere, is the biggest opportunity. We do not have resources in our portfolio at the moment, but all of us in uh, Koala, I think because we've been, uh, we've witnessed coal rehabilitation, you know, nasty, stupid sustainability reports that these mining companies have, have written over the years, we're pretty tuned into it. And we, but we like the idea of our resources building, you know, a new global economy, but we have to do it better. That's the key thing. We have to do it better. We have to have better engagement with Indigenous people if we're intending to dig up their land because there's so many appalling stories. The history of it is bad. Can we do it better? We have to do it better. And I don't think we should be digging it up unless we do it better. So we're watching and learning and thinking a lot about that. It's a really important thing. Yeah, it's important. And I think it's something that can be, like you touched on before, a bit depressing and it can be overwhelming. But I think if you can sort of flip it in your head, you know, it's exciting and it's an incredible opportunity mm -hmm. for what we as a nation are able to do in this space that can really have an impact to quite literally change the world which I guess makes me wonder, and you did touch on a little bit previously in terms of our own sort of personal impact on an individual level, but do you, where do you sit on like as individuals, you know, actually being able, being able to create an impact and, you know, by aligning our investments with our values, does that make a difference? Yes. If everyone said, if everyone acknowledged gambling was a social uh, problem, well, everyone pulled their money out of gambling stocks. That would be good, not ethical, causing social. Take it, don't have it in alcohol as much as we might drink. You don't have to invest in it. Um, resources, you've still got coal shares, even banking. Think twice about that. Are you only investing because of a dividend? You know, you've got a history of a company with a dividend, for instance, and not caring about what the company does. So, so I, I do believe people. Unfortunately, I think, you know, a lot of people just want the money, but we need, you know, when, when there's a crisis, take the floods, the fires, it's not money in the end that pulls you together, that you end up caring about. It's people. Mm. It's us. We do not live in an economy. We live in an ecology and we have to look after it. We shouldn't forget it. We also had an incredible live event about the sustainability space um, and one of our speakers, Camille, did show us a lot of like factual evidence about investing in your values can also lead to a return to people that are concerned with that money aspect. It's, you know, it's kind of almost this myth a little bit that if you're investing with your values and you're investing in sustainable practices or businesses that you're kind of losing your return but she showed us some really interesting kind of like indexes and graphs that kind of showed really mm -hmm. differently. And I think, you know, from where I sit personally, like sometimes it can be really hard because you think the change is so, it's going to be so difficult with the structures that we have in place. But if investing is a long-term thing for you, then really the benefit will come. You just have to be patient. Yes, patience. Otherwise you're just a trader. 
And we know trade people who just trade lose money. No, it's not, not about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I I agree. And and think of real estate. I mean, you don't buy a house and turn it around next year anyway. You know, it, it's the same principle. It's a, a long term thing, and then you do get. Uh, an increased value from that investment, that real estate investment. I was going to say that's probably a good example for a lot of like Australian listeners because we can all really anchor ourselves. Not that Maddie and I own property, but everyone can really anchor themselves and be like, oh, yeah, you hold your house for a while. I may as well hold my investments for a while. <laughs> uh, the, the For me, as a new investor, seeing the portfolio you know, do this is confronting. I feel it. I've ne- because I've never had it before. But then I look at other indexes and statistics where you see people that invested long-term uh, in stocks did better than with banks, and there's a lot of that. So that is, that is what rich people understood. And I think average people, because they never participated in it, never understood uh, and I've learnt it through my koala journey and I realise, well, why didn't I do that? Why didn't someone ever tell me about that? And what would I have had to have known to be able to do it? So if you like you said, you, you know, you, did you need a lot of money to start? And even I, I, I've had a few, what would you call it, times when I thought, oh, maybe I should be doing this, say 10, 15 years ago, and I knew people in the finance sector. And one, I said, oh, I hear you're helping people invest and, and maybe you could help me. So this is a guy I knew. And he, he goes, yeah, yeah, you got a spare mill? And, uh, and I go, I'm sorry. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've got a spare million. Yeah, wow. And I remember being oh really God. upset about that when that got said to me and that he was only interested in uh, investing for his friends if they had a million dollars to invest. That was how he mm. was running some part of his fund. And what was his fee? <laughs> well, who knows? Well, he was making very money high out of it. Of <laughs> he was making, but I wasn't, I, I was thinking maybe I could, you know, find $10,000 and maybe I could start something because I was like many people mm. who thought then you had to have at least that. Whereas Koala, you can start $10 a week. Quite a difference. I think that even the comparison between buying property and buying investments is so interesting. You talked about how the volatility of your portfolio can make you nervous sometimes seeing it go up and down. But I remember someone telling me that when you own property, you don't have someone coming around every other day saying, this is what it's worth today. This is what it's worth today. It's, That's a it's good that point. forced sort of long-term yeah. turn mm. off the share market and sort of check it in three years, in five years, in 10 years, which is exactly what you do with property. And I thought that was such such an interesting comparison because we get so sort of drawn into the ups and downs of the stock market, even though we know that we should be focusing on the long term. That's a good story. I will definitely use that. That's a good, a good analogy, yes. <laughs> no one is coming around telling you that. So the question we've all been waiting for then really <laughs> is, you know, we've been talking about Koala, your investment app, which people should definitely check out. Is there a company within your portfolio that is exciting you at the moment? In particular, I have been very interested in a solar vehicle company. I don't know whether this is a reaction to Elon Musk because when I've saw his factory, I thought, wow, that was, you know, amazing, those factories that he's building. But Elon Musk, hey, is, tels- is Tesla, you know, the be-all and the end-all of, uh, of uh, the new vehicle? So it's a solar vehicle company where the solar will drive the, the vehicle. And I thought when we're talking about all the problems with batteries and everything that we have – because cars are still made of steel, right, needing metallurgical coal to make it until green hydrogen comes on board. That is very exciting to me. That is, you know, Jetson's space, the sun driving cars, having it embedded in the materials. <laughs> I love the Jetsons. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, that, that probably excites me. Mm. Yeah. 
So I, that's my sono. I, have, I was going to say, I don't think I've ever actually heard about solar vehicles before. So that's a completely new concept altogether. Very cool. Have they, do you know, have they actually developed sort of a car that is in use now mm-hmm. or is it and still a working they're doing a, a, so they have thousands of people who have signed up to get them. They're doing a big road show through America soon. And Ooh. so it's like like all uh, electric vehicles, you know, the technology, the transformation. People said to me they were overseas and they just looked at another, you know, not a Tesla, another one, and how excited they were. And it goes 500 kilometres and looked really posh on the inside, much more interesting. So the, the growth, let's face it, we do live in a mobile world, particularly in Australia, I mean, imagine what we're telling people, oh, you can't have a car anymore because, you know, they're polluting. Well, we certainly don't want to hear that. But the idea of the silence, Mm. you know, that will come with these new vehicles. Think how noisy and disgusting all those roads are. You know, we will live in a different, the sound of our future will be different. So I, the and the idea of the sun, the sun being our main energy supply on Earth, driving the vehicles of the future, That, to me, if they can, all the tech people working on that, that's that's it. (laughs) That's exciting. Someone was telling me the other day that if you had a Tesla in your house and you had, like, solar panels on your roof, you could, like, power your house, which would power your Tesla, and then you can plug your Tesla back into your house, which will power your house. And it just Uh makes this whole, like, economy that functions everything and you it's all based off solar. And I was like, oh my God, my mind is blown. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. So the issue for the Tesla and the generation of cars now are the batteries and the size of the batteries and what the batteries are made of. Yeah. And there'll be a lot of, um, well, it's, it's fast at the moment, that technology and the evolution of that technology. Um, and it will improve. I'm just putting new solar panels on uh, the roof of a, here, one of the houses here, and the the capacity of the size of the solar panels is like eight times better than the ones I put on 15 years ago. I think, you know, in, within 15 wow. years, the size of the panels, the capacity of the panels, uh, and now the storage options that are available, it it's... So we will, I mean, what you girls will be living through will be, you know, be like the start of electricity. You know, once upon a time there were candles <laughs> and here we are. So, no, I, it's it's exciting. Well, Patrice, I honestly would love to sit here all day and just continue chatting with you, but we probably should start to round it out. So one final question that we do have for you is what piece of advice would you give to someone starting out on their investing journey? Start soon and start small. Mm. start small you know you don't have to be confident you build confidence yeah it's you're starting small yeah you know you when you're a musician you don't play Carnegie Hall in the beginning you might play at the local pub you start small (laughs) and starting small is good and it doesn't matter what age you are either so yeah I love that advice because I feel like we've had a lot of friends who have started very small and then when they've built their confidence, you get more and more conversation out of them mm-hmm. and excitement. And now they're like on their trajectories, which is which is great. But Patrice, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Do you want to plug anything about Koala where people can find it before we go? Well, I should say one important thing. It's Koala. Remember when you were one and couldn't say Koala? It's koala, K-W-A-L-A, koala. It's a koala. It's baby. It's young. It's new. It's koala. Mm. So that that's, I suppose that's the plug I'd like to say. And we will make sure that we put a link to it in our episode notes as well so you can go and check it out. Patrice, thank you so much for your time. Great chatting, Maddie, Sophie, all the best. 